witnessing. Um, I think you have to be honest and say it's an aspect of Christian life which fills many of us with fear and guilt. Um, and yet it's inescapably an integral part of what we're called to as individuals and as a community. Like it or not, we are all witnesses, for better or for worse, to the glory and grace of Christ in our lives. So how can we bear witness more effectively? In, in what follows, I've got, I have no intention to, to lay a guilt trip on anyone. I'm only too aware of my own inadequacies in this area. But I do want to encourage all of us to think about how we can bear radiant witness to Christ. Over the last few weeks, we've been following a series called Authentic Community, looking at some of the joys, privileges, and responsibilities of being part of church. <clears throat> we've been drawing on the chapter headings of Tony Marida's book, Love Your Church, which provide a handy breakdown of many key parts, key aspects of church life. So far, we've looked at the joy of belonging and the importance of welcoming of gathering regularly and the need to care for one another. The different opportunities to serve and the importance of honouring one another as well as our leaders. And following on from all this is the need to bear witness to Christ. If we share in the privilege and joy of belonging to God's people, then we're also called to point others to Christ, the source of this great blessing. In um, the words of 1 Peter 2, verse 9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now... You have received mercy. If we're the glad recipients of God's grace, then we owe him all our worship and witness. And far from coming from fear and guilt, our witness should come from the overspill, from the overflow of our joy in Christ. If we are going to be effective witnesses, then we need to have a heart that delights in Christ. Of course, when it comes to witnessing, we don't all have to witness in the same way. Some of us may be very direct types, like Peter, unafraid to be bold and confrontational. Some of us may be more intellectual types, like Paul, able to reason and argue for the faith, although he too could be bold when the um, situation demanded it. We may be testimonial types, like the blind man in John chapter 9. We don't know all the answers, but we know that our life has been changed. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. We may be interpersonal types like Matthew, Levi, who, who put on a big banquet for all his tax-collecting friends to introduce them to Jesus. We may have the invitational approach of the Samaritan woman who invited everyone in the town to come and see for themselves. Or we may have primarily Tabitha's strength in serving, always, in serving, always doing good and helping the poor. Of course, there might be times when we're, we're called on to, to use any of these approaches, but I think there's comfort in knowing that we don't have to be forced into being what we're not. Some of us are natural extroverts, others are not. But we're all called to bear witness in different ways. When we work together as God's people, we can contribute different giftings as we seek to reach out to those around us with the gospel message. 
Indeed, we all have something to offer. But of course, you must have the desire to tell people about Jesus. We should want to share his love out of the overflow of our hearts. You know, generally we're, we're very ready to talk about the things that we love and treasure, the things that we revere and hope in. When Susan agreed to marry me, I, was, I wanted to tell everybody. Um, when my favourite football player, Tony Curry, scored the ITV goal of the season um, against Southampton, um, <laughs> I, 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 all my friends knew about it, uh, whether they wanted to or not. <laughs> Sorry, Bruce. Um, <clears throat> but we, we're generally very ready to talk about the things that we love and treasure, the things we revere and hope in. And that's where our passage comes in this morning. 1 Peter 3, verse, um, 13 to 17. I'm just going to read it one more time. Now, who is there to harm you? If you are zealous for what is good. But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your heart, honour Christ the Lord as holy. Always prepared to make a defence to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behaviour in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. Here, um, <clears throat> uh, Peter was writing to scattered Christians throughout Asia Minor, what's now modern Turkey, where Sue and I were travelling earlier this year. And the environment was pretty hostile then, as it, is, as it is for Turks now, to the open profession of Christian faith. These Christians were facing slander and ridicule. They were often marginalised for their faith and facing the prospect of very real physical persecution. Well, thankfully, that kind of violent persecution is still pretty rare in our own society. But many around us are pretty hardened to the gospel and often think they're happy enough without the gospel. Thank you very much. So how do we cultivate a heart for sharing the gospel message with those around us? In... Um, uh, no, that's the wrong one. Oh, well. In this passage, Peter gives us three timeless priorities for Christian witness that remain true anywhere and any time. Firstly, Peter emphasises the importance of doing good. Secondly, he urges us to redirect our fear. And thirdly, he encourages us to be ready always and with anyone. Just come on. Oh, yeah. Firstly, then, Peter em emphasises the importance of doing good. Actually, this is an emphasis throughout his first letter. In chapter 2, verse 12, he says, Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honourable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. And verse 20 of the same chapter says, If when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. Uh, the beginning of, of chapter 3, Christian wives are encouraged to submit to their husbands so that even if, if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. Never underestimate the powerful witness of a Christian wife. Years ago at our Roger Carswell mission, we heard a powerful testimony of how Roy Castle was won to Christ by the total transformation of his wife, Fiona Castle. <clears throat> so we shouldn't be surprised when chapter 3, verse 13 says, Now who is there to harm you 
if you are zealous for doing what is good. And a few verses later, it speaks of having a good conscience, conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behaviour may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. Um, it, uh, <clears throat> so it seems to me that some Christians today seem to have withdrawn from sharing the gospel message. They can give the impression that they're embarrassed of the message of sin and salvation, of forgiveness at the cross. They sometimes talk as if it is enough just to do kingdom, to bless others by doing good deeds. Well, let's be clear. It's, it's not enough just to do um, good deeds. The gospel message certainly needs to be shared verbally. How can they be saved unless they hear the message? But good deeds are certainly part of our witness. As Jesus says in Matthew 5, verse 16, in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Clearly, if we are rude and aggressive towards others, if we live inconsistently with our faith, then we undermine our witness. But living a life of love and good deeds can be a compelling witness before a watching world. To be a faithful witness, firstly, look to live an attractive life under the Lordship of Christ, blessing those around you. As uh, Tony Marida says in his book, the fruit of the Spirit displayed in our practical actions in life can make a tremendous impact on a watching world. It's interesting to see how a joyful, gentle, loving and peaceful person really stands out today. Let's look to serve those around us in Christ's love and the Spirit's power. Live like this, says Peter, and we will can certainly provoke questions. Secondly, redirect your fear. Peter encourages us to redirect our fear. I'm sure we all know that fear can keep us from being an effective witness. It can hold you back from serving someone, from giving them a Christian book, from inviting them to a meal or a Christian event or, or getting into a discussion about the gospel. It's easy to be intimidated by the fear of how people will react. And of course, we should be conscious that we're in a spiritual battle. We have an enemy who doesn't want us to speak freely about our faith. But Peter... Yeah, I'll go down. Peter urges us, urges Christians to have no fear of them. Fear can enslave us, trap us, and constrain our actions. Proverbs 29, verse 25 says, The fear of man lays a snare. And I would suggest that most of us are subject to that crippling fear. One or two of us may be fearless evangelists, and if that's you, brilliant. Um, please be encouraged in that. But most of us find this really difficult. Recently, I <coughs> asked my creative writing class along to the Andy Kind event, but I was surprised how difficult I found it. Just to drum up the courage to invite them to a low cringe event. It shouldn't have been difficult, but it was. Why do we find it hard to, to share our faith in different ways? Because we have an enemy who opposes us and because of the fear of men. But Peter says we can overcome this fear by revering Jesus more than other people. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your heart honour Christ the Lord as holy. 
We need to set apart Christ as holy, to be awed by his presence, to, to give him his rightful place in our lives, and to delight in his lordship. When we remember the holiness and glory of the Lord Jesus Christ, it should help us to keep others in their proper perspective. It's awe of Jesus that makes us a witness for Jesus, says Tony Merida. Living with gospel intentionality means that we don't live with a spirit of fear, but rather with a humble confidence in the Lord's presence and a humble reverence before the Lord's holiness. It's out of this heart that we will engage our unbelieving friends and family with the gospel. Please note, I'm not saying that um, <coughs> we should exchange our fear of people for um, being afraid of God and therefore, uh, in the sense that we normally understand, and therefore witnessing out of fear, but that we should, we should give our awe and reverence to God, that we should, we should uh, recognise that he is greater than those things that we fear. Then thirdly, Peter says we should be ready always and with anyone to be a witness to Christ's glory and power in our lives. Always being prepared to make a defence to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Always and anyone. Be prepared. So often um, I think we make excuses for failing to engage uh, with those around us. But Peter calls us to be ready when people ask questions. We need to be willing to talk about our hope. We don't have to be academic experts who can win any debate. That might be nice, but it won't necessarily win anyone to Christ. But we can all have a witness, because if we're Christians, then we all have a living hope. One Peter 1 verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That's the hope that we have in Jesus. And remember, hope in the New Testament is not a kind of wishful thinking. It's a settled confidence in future glory is a hope which it which should energize our lives now and which should shine out in a world that so often lacks hope sometimes we think we need all the answers and it can certainly be helpful to read a, a few books about common questions which Christians face but it's never about winning an argument Again, as Tony Merida says, to be an effective witness, you need more than a knockdown argument on paper. You need a joyful song in your heart. You need more than logical answers. You need a heart captivated by Jesus. As I say, a witness does an effective witness does not come from fear and guilt, but out of the overflow of our joy in Christ. And that could be all of us as we look to Jesus and the Spirit's power. A new Christian may have no theological training whatsoever, and yet they can be on fire with contagious Christian hope. Those of us who took part in the, the recent Alpha course will remember just how encouraged we were by the vibrant faith of one young girl who'd been, only been a Christian for about two months but who was absolutely on fire with enthusiasm for her Lord. Witnessing is not just 
for the elite, the crack troops of the Christian world. It's, it's for all of us who rejoice in the hope of the gospel. You don't need to be an expert. Just share your testimony of what faith in Christ means to you. Non-Christians won't always understand our theology, but they can recognise love, joy, peace and hope when it's real. It's interesting, as we read the, gosp read the Gospels, we see that Jesus, in his interactions with people, never uses one canned presentation of the Gospel. He interacts with people right where they are. Well, it may be very useful to learn one way to explain the Gospel simply. I like the, the, the Navigator's uh, version where they have two cliffs, um, man and God separated, and the cross as a bridge between, the cross of Jesus as a bridge between the gap. It, it could be useful to learn one way to explain the gospel simply, but don't get tied up in it. Be prepared to ask questions and answer them with gospel clarity and grace. Last year, I went to an evangelism um, conference at Langham Place and I was enormously encouraged by a Jewish Christian, Randy Newman. Like me, he'd been trained to try and take people through the Campus Crusade Gospel booklet, knowing God personally. But he always, he'd always found it unnatural and difficult. But he found that he had much more fruitful discussions as he engaged with people's questions and asked questions of his own to draw them out and to explore the weaknesses in their thinking. So I, wanna, um, I do want to recommend two books by Randy Newman. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, I've left one of them at home. Um, but uh, Mere Evangelism, about the lessons he learns on evangelism from the writings of C.S. Lewis, and another one called Questioning Evangelism, about the way he found asking different questions opened up fruitful and natural gospel conversations. I'll make sure I bring that book in next week. Um, but I can highly recommend those. And as much as it matters... Um, oh, this is frozen. As much as it matters what we say... The way we say it is also essential. When we recommend Christ to others, we need to do it in a Christ-like manner. We're not to speak harshly or with condescension, but, says Peter, with gentleness and respect. And we see the same thing elsewhere in Colossians 4, verse 5, where, Peter, where Paul says, Walk in wisdom towards outsiders, making the best use of time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. The NIV puts it slightly differently. Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Make the most of every opportunity. I don't believe that we should force unnatural conversations. But far too often we dodge real opportunities with non-Christian friends and neighbours out of mere timidity. Let's be ready to take up opportunities when they arise. Not from guilt, but out of love for our friends and joy in Jesus Christ. Let your conversation be full of grace, seasoned with salt, says Paul. Try not to be boring or monotonous in your witness. Uh, I'm, I'm sure it's good to be lively and colourful, uh, making use of your own personality and the gifts God has given you. Use your wit and let your excitement in the gospel shine. 
Melt hard hearts with kindness and take an interest in people. Remember, each one is unique. We don't need to use exactly the same approach in talking to, to different people. Share Christ, but be yourself. And one other thing that is evident from this Colossians passage is the need for prayer. Continue steadfastly in prayer, says Paul, just before this verse. Being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. I think if the Apostle Paul needed prayer to open his mouth clearly, then certainly we do. So, let's be ready to, to shine for Jesus. God has placed most of us in a network of relationships. Whether family, neighbours, colleagues or friends. Or just people we meet at the shops. Can we identify those who we can pray for regularly? And let God work in their hearts and open up opportunities. Can you think about whether you can invite someone to dinner, to, to play sports, to watch a movie or to come to a church event with you? Can you find ways of blessing and serving them? Can you ask them to, to read a book or article with you as a way to lead into a gospel conversation? Or can you look for ways to, uh, to actually open up with them about faith? The gospel is too good to keep to ourselves. When we started um, this church, we said we wanted to be um, a beacon of light to the whole community, pointing everyone to Jesus. So we can't keep Jesus to ourselves. The church is not um, a yachting club. It, it's, it's a fleet of, of fishing boats. The light, to mix metaphors, the, the light needs to go out from us if it's going to reach people living in darkness. It may shine forth in different ways and touch different lives in different ways, but there needs to be that heart to reach out to others, however it's done. In a few weeks' time, we'll be delivering gospel leaflets um, to people in our own immediate community. We're... we're, we're um, we do like our own news sheet, but we're doing a community news sheet with gospel message, which we'll be taking out along with the invites to our Christmas services. And it would be great um, to see many people from the congregation getting involved in taking those out to reach as many people as we can in the community. We need to have that heart to reach out to others and to, to shine our light in the community. In our everyday lives, let's be ready to shine for Christ in the Spirit's power. And collectively, let's be ready to support each other as we seek to bear witness to Jesus Christ. Because he's worth it. We... However we witness, let's not witness out of guilt or fear, but out of the overflow of, of joy in Christ in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.